Welcome to the ultimate edition of the D200 video. It's been exactly one year since the fabled release of the Snyder Cut. So many people have unpacked this movie. The wealth of world building, the minutia of character development, but none of these shared examples are so striking in my view than what comes of the Kent family farm truck. My name is Josh White, and in this video, I'm gonna be breaking down the character arc of the Kent family, and in turn, the Dodge D200. My glasses have been on all day, so uh, let's uh, do some investigative journalism. I'm not redoing all my videos. I don't have plans on redoing anything else, but in this video I was just plain wrong. I don't like that feeling, so I'm going to do it right this time. Originally, in Zack Snyder's supposedly complete trilogy, there wasn't any real significance given to this truck. There was no discovery scene, and so the truck didn't get a whole lot of attention. Instead, Snyder mashes Clark's growth between the Kryptonian ship entering the atmosphere and waves crashing against the Debbie Sue as it cuts through the ocean. But unsurprisingly, the four-hour epic gave us greater insights into Martha, her happiness, her growth, her grief, and ultimately, her relief. Unassuming, this is told through the many Kent family vehicles throughout the trilogy, and it did so without dialogue or flair. Yes, the D200 specifically existed within the theatrical cut of the Justice League, but the additional scenes previously lost to us provide greater context and help us understand just how wrong I was in presuming that there was no real significance to the rusty blue farm truck. Stick with me here. As a whole, this is a lot more of a sentimental video, but I think more people vibe with the vehicle slash part identification on my videos, so I'll front load that here. I encourage you to keep watching past because this truck is a central character in the Kent family's progression, but I get more emotional than usual with this video. Just another reason to start out with the nuts and bolts. While I'm doing that, I'm going to also focus on answering, is this the right vehicle for the character? The character in this video being Martha. In a way, that singular question is the basis of my channel. So let's do that here, starting with some vehicle history. The film's Dodge D200 was provided by Volo Auto Museum, an Illinois-based setup which worked out nicely for Smallville as it was being shot in Plano, Illinois. When asked to partner again after providing vehicles for WB's The Great Gatsby, the director of the museum, Brian Grams, provided a description of what Warner Brothers was looking for, saying it needed to be an old farm truck that looked well-worn, broken in, and something that looked like it's been sitting in a field. Of added value to the story, Volo Auto Museum sourced this truck from Kansas and hauled it back to the movie production base in Yorkville, Illinois. But for main vehicles, major motion pictures don't rely on just one, but instead have several backups for the rigorous shooting schedules. But Dodge trucks aren't too plentiful, and getting it to match is even harder. Grams and his crew managed to find two more D200s, likely of different years than the originally Source 68. Unfortunately, all citations here are suspect since the car museum didn't get their year right. Comparing just the front end of a 1963 D200 against that of the family of Steel's D200 shows some pretty noticeable differences between the first and second generation. With the side markers the way they are, the best model year matchup is 1968, and after hindsight has set in, that's also what Volo is claiming it to be for those passing through. The special effects department then went about color matching to get to the dusty truck required for the script. Identifying further, hopefully becoming worthy of the Ultimate Edition title, we'll use the scene of Jonathan Kent working in a dimly lit engine bay while Clark plays nearby. Using the valve cover and oil cap as comparative landmarks, we can confidently say he's toiling away with the standard maintenance of the 225 cubic inch Chrysler Slant 6. Today's sun setting on an evening replacing the spark plugs with the champion branded component and fiddling his screwdriver near the throttle body. Or perhaps the fuel filter? Other noteworthy additions, the distributor cap and what looks like the air filter are out of place. We also have, I mean, that looks an awful lot like fueler gauges. Maybe this evening was actually in all hours under the sun workday, and Jonathan still has at least another half hour to go putting all these parts back. Some commentary about this power plant, stuff that's already been said and maybe just needs rehashing for the movie enthusiast. This engine was made with the 30 degree slant, which was novel in the 60s stateside, so that one, Chrysler could engineer a larger engine and still fit it under the platform's hood line, and two, so that craftsmen would have better access to engine accessories. 
with the manifolds on one side that also helps with healthy airflow for both intake and exhaust. Remember, for the late 50s, early 60s, these were the micro adjustments of engine technology. There were two slant six volumetric sizes in Chrysler's arsenal, but the D-series trucks utilized the larger 225 cubic inch volume, which would net nearly 140 horsepower output. Attached to it, you can take a confident gamble that these left the factory with the A904 transmission, which is a three-speed automatic. If you're a gearhead and you want a ton, and I mean a wealth, a treasure trove of knowledge, go to Uncle Tony's garage on YouTube and just browse at his library of information. And yeah, I'll just leave that plug there. Before moving on earlier, I had said that there were at least two other D200s which were used as backups for the movie. One of them got kind of an amateur walk around almost a year prior to Man of Steel's release. It's not great, but it is credible given that this is the Volo Auto Museum lot and two crushed Wagoneers are right next to it. While an amateur video, which I don't recommend listening to since it's more than a little inaccurate, we learn that this backup hero truck came with a different engine option and a mismatch of tires all around. I'll try to clean up the footage so you're not getting vertigo. We have a collection of Bridgestone Dueler HT, Dayton Baja AT, and Goodyear Wrangler radial tires. The Bridgestone tires are on the rear driven wheels, while the Goodyear tires are up front, and the Dayton Baja AT laying comfortably in the truck bed with another Bridgestone. Some of these tire options and their tread patterns have gone through redesign and obsolescence, so you can't find an exact tire to mimic, though you can get close. From cockpit controls and a look under the hood, we can see and deduce that the Kents also had an LA318 engine with an A727 3-speed automatic transmission. A few naysayers have deemed it a polyspherical 318 V8, but the exhaust in take order of the heads is for the LA318 V8. Mounted to the engine is an Edelbrock four barrel carburetor. It's super interesting. Most likely the Volo crew got it this way and the previous owner had some aftermarket work done, but there's no reverse, meaning the previous owners didn't replace a transmission that is plentiful in the States. Even though we didn't see this engine bay on screen, there's a good chance this backup was not the truck shooting scenes for Zack Snyder's Justice League, since Volo Auto Museum put it up for sale before Man of Steel's release. Of power options that we, the public, can see in two of the three hero trucks, the D200s and the Snyderverse are the lower power outputs on the spectrum of engine options. Not a big deal, we don't engine shame on this channel. With the engines now identified, does this truck fit the needs for the role? It absolutely fits the script, and we'll get into that later, but other than aesthetics, it likely couldn't function as you may think it would have to in order to serve the discovery scene. The Kryptonian shuttle, through some measurement detective work against the average height of a woman, is approximately 18 feet 4 inches. Further, according to Colonel Hardy, the craft maxes out at 17,000 pounds, a size and weight that lives outside the capabilities of the D200. Luckily, the Kent farm has plenty of equipment capable of hauling it back to the barn. No part of Superman's cannon has John and Martha hauling the spaceship away in the family truck. With the crash landing happening on a clear autumn night, thanks novelization, there's a chance that the year's crop would cover the crash site, keeping the shuttle shielded from prying eyes, long enough for Jonathan to haul it back the next day or so, though he likely lost a sizable swath of crops just by dragging it through the field. And finally, let's reflect on what is ultimately the truck's only real job, transporting the family. With the bench seat, they obviously have the seating room for their family of three. And while it seems sketchy now, rigorous laws for child restraints in Kansas didn't pass until 1989 after the fatal crash of a three-month-old in the Watkins v. Hartsock case of negligent child seating. So even if illegal now, it could, with clear conscience, perform the duty of family transportation during Clark's youth. There's an incredible amount of grief in the three DC movies that Zack Snyder directed. And while the Dodge D200 doesn't show up in Batman v Superman, we catch the babyest of glimpses of the cross and headlamp of a 4th gen Ram 1500 that Martha could have been running toward in the kidnapping scene. There's some real development with Martha's vehicles. While her husband is still alive, they own at least three family vehicles together. The Jeep Grand Wagoneer, the Red Dodge Ram, and the Blue Dodge D200. For the most part, during the modern day times of the Man of Steel, the vehicle primarily showcased on the Kent property is the Red Dodge Ram, which left the factory floor sometime between 1981 and 1985. I'm not ready to say with confidence that it's a 1981 model year. Further messying the identification of the Dodge Ram is the continuity error between the bullying scene and the... Well, I guess that's a bullying scene too? 
The stamped badge isn't there during the earlier scene, despite them being the same model of vehicle. On a separate occasion, a moment of affection between Ma and Pa Kent was shared by the D200 as Jonathan was envisioning a heroic future for their son. Several years further, this is the same truck Jonathan Kent decides to give admission to Clark about his heritage. And noticeably, after Jonathan's death, the wagon isn't seen again. Even if it wasn't totaled, who would blame Martha for not wanting to be reminded of the day she lost her beloved? This truck, the early 80s Dodge Ram, presumably becomes Jonathan's work truck between Clark's childhood and adolescence. We see the Dodge D200 parked in the divisive may be seen, and later on, he has taken Clark along for an errand at the same age to the local shop in the red truck. Then back to present, this vehicle, now with stamped lettering on the tailgate, gets thrown through the house during a confrontation between Martha and General Zod, so she obviously can't use that anymore. If you'll allow me to shift tone for just a second, in the midst of all this chaos, Martha says something that will come to define myself as an uncle first, but then three years later, as a father. It's only stuff, Clark. Oh, it can always be replaced. Honestly, that line had more impact than any other as I sat in theaters for the midnight premiere. In this moment, Martha has set a precedent that this house, the furniture, these cars, they're all replaceable, but the memories we tie to the stuff, that's when things get tricky. What happens when your home holds so many memories? What happens when those memories fuse themselves with field equipment, baseball mitts, toys, and even those cars? After Jonathan's death, she doesn't try to salvage the Grand Wagoneer. Instead, she continues using Jonathan's work truck, holding her late husband as close to her as possible. But what happens when a malevolent being throws it through the house? What does she have left? After the death of Clark Joseph Kent and after leaving her stuff, the stuff that could always be replaced, she's left without being able to collect or even carry all those salvageable, tangible memories. And yet we see her driving away in the broken down Dodge D200. Having helped during the home moves of women beyond Martha's age, I've seen what uprooting all of that history can do. It's an incredibly difficult process that becomes more final as the move progresses. They want to hold on to as many things as they can, but as the day moves along, they come to realize that much of it is even more heartbreaking to take with them, that some things should get left behind, putting the time what little money she had to preserve the celebration of the vehicle that made her an expectant mother this is true motherly love. I've made an assertion that the Dodge D200 is the same truck that John and Martha Kent find Kal-El in. How do I know? I don't, not really. The investigative journalism which I could do just gives me a good faith assurance. So what are my sources? I tried going straight to THE source, but considering how many questions he must be getting every day, I'm okay with going to some secondary sources. So instead we have a couple of behind the scenes images and novelizations that we can draw from. And I'll just list these out bullet point style. The junior novel lets us know that it's a dusty truck. We don't see the red Dodge Ram until Clark is in his early teenage years. We know Jonathan was working on the D200 when Clark was in early elementary. Then, to get a defined age, we can go to the casting, which tells us that elementary Clark is 9 years old and that early teenager Clark is 13. Between the age of 9 and 13, Jonathan Kent, having spent long summer days fixing the truck, decides it's time to put the dusty truck out to pasture. He's not going to get rid of it though. He doesn't appear to have thrown anything away that connects to his son even remotely. So if Clark is 13 years old, toward the end of its life cycle, I'm going to strongly posit that the D200 is the same truck they found Clark in. It also can't be the 1981 to 1985 Dodge Ram if the Kryptonian landing is in 1980 at the latest. The novelizations also tell us that Clark's wandering phase is 33 years after the landing of the Kryptonian spaceship. If the events of Man of Steel occur in 2013, the landing would take place in 1980. Only if the events of the movie are set in the future would my discernment be off. So approximately 20 years have passed between the truck bed scene and the truck stop scene. The duration of time that the events of the movies take place is unknown, but we can assume no more than a month's time occurred for the separate events of both Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. There are 18 months between the climax of the first movie and the beginning of Batman v Superman's events, and one, maybe three months at most, after BVS do we get the setting of Justice League. The clue there, Lois's pregnancy. So from the time Pa Kent has decided to park the Dodge D200 and Martha uses it to haul away her possessions from her Smallville home, there is a time difference of approximately 22 years. 22 years! It's been sitting in that field until Martha decides to wake it up. As a final memento, Martha Kent resurrects the truck that she found Clark in before she leaves her home for what she thinks is for good. And then, and here's the real beauty of it, she's in the same truck days later. 
when she once again finds her boy standing in a field on the storied Kent property, where only months before she had seen him last alive, providing words of comfort and steadiness. She now, hesitantly, yet eagerly, greets the last son with open arms. As an automotive actor, this truck fits the mold of the story while allowing the discovery scene to happen off screen. But the real crux of this character's, this truck's journey, comes through coming back and being the linchpin in the Smallville legacy. Martha having all of these little moments, taking it from the property before leaving, using it to haul away her life, and then returning to find Clark in a Kent field? This truck's return was wildly understated. More than anything, I'm grateful that Zack Snyder was able to craft this perfect moment by planting seeds way back in Man of Steel. Usually, this video answers the question, is this the right vehicle for the character? In many ways, the hero car is considered a prop and nothing more. But with the added revelatory scenes from Zack Snyder, this truck has so much more meaning to this grieving mother. This truck, without a doubt, is the best vehicle for Martha Kent. We should be able to feel the emotional impact of this in theaters. The truck is still in the theatrical cut, but we didn't get that chance. Instead, we get two views in the field scene without the context of Martha leaving her home with it. Cheers to you, Zack Snyder, and thank you for the Justice League. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.